Welcome to Activism Munich for our second part of our exclusive interview with former Finance Minister of Greece and the founder of the Democracy in Europe Movement 25, Yanis Varoufakis. In this segment, I talked to him about a number of issues, which include the impacts that the privatization process is having on the Greek people, insights into the negotiation process that he held with the Troika as Finance Minister in 2015, and whether he thinks capitalism is reformable. I want to talk about privatization. In December 2015, a German airport operator called Fraport won the bid to operate and maintain 14 regional airports in Greece. According to the website, Lufthansa owns around 8.45% shares in Fraport. Uh, specifically about privatization, have the Greek people benefited from it? I keep an open mind on privatization. Uh, if, when people ask me, are you in favor or against? My answer is it depends which privatization and under what con conditions and circumstances. So when it came to the privatization of, let's say, a telecom company, the Greek telecom company, I don't think that that was a bad idea. But if you ask me about the privatization of uh, the electricity grid, I'm dead against it because it, it never works. Uh, whenever you privatize uh, such uh, a natural monopoly, the result is inefficiency and uh, corruption. Uh, California style, for instance, right? On the question of the Greek regional airports, even if you're a neoliberal who believes in privatization, you should question the sale of all 14 regional airports to one company. Uh, supposedly, I mean, when Margaret Thatcher introduced privatization on a neoliberal agenda that I fought against, I used to live in Britain then, I used to demonstrate against uh, the, uh, Mrs. Thatcher's policies, but I don't believe that Mrs. Thatcher would e ever consider selling all airports to one company because the point of privatization was to bring competition into the market. That's, there's no competition there when one company buys all the airports. <laughs> so uh, I'm afraid that the fact that the Greek government, actually no Greek government since 2010, has owned its uh, economic and social reform policy agenda leads to colonial uh, type um, deals which in the end do not benefit the economy uh, and make the people of the country feel that effectively they are being abused and exploited. And this is a, never a good feeling to have when you want to reform a country. Let's move on to some topics that I think require more scrutiny. Wolfgang Schäuble, followed by the media here, made a big fuss about Greece's moral obligation to pay its debt. The media here in Germany hasn't made much fuss about the moral obligation to end the suffering of the Greek people. Um, I want to test the memorandum of understanding uh, and its compatibility with the Declaration of Human Rights. And I've picked uh, two articles from the Declaration and let's go through them together and I want to know your opinions uh, about them, whether they're compatible or not. Article 1. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and shall act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. Your opinion? Well, it's a very fine piece of text, but it is not particularly pertinent when it comes to the policies of the Eurogroup and the Troika as uh, anyone who's experienced uh, those mach machinations knows. But let me make a very simple point. Capitalism only flourished when moralizing about debt ended. Let me remind you that there used to be debt prisons in the 19th century. If you were a businessman and you lost uh, your capacity to repay your debt, you ended up in debt prison. Effectively, you were finished as a human being. You lost your human rights, your dignity. Capitalism only took off when the concept of limited liability it was introduced. You can start a business, you can fail, but that doesn't mean that your kids are going to end up in a debt prison. When we are bringing a moralizing agenda back into the midst of a crisis like the one we're having in the Eurozone, what we're doing is when they're mining the very principle of capitalism and it takes a left winger in order to say that. Mm -hmm. So even if you are a liberal who believes in the market's capacity to bring about a miracle of growth and stability and so on and so forth, this kind of uh, 
moralizing and finger pointing um, is not helpful and must end. And let's not forget that Germany was given an, um, uh, uh, an opportunity to pick, it, pick itself up from the bootstraps in 1953 only due to the Americans' insistence that the London Conference in 1953 should write off more than 60% of German debt in order to allow this country uh, to fulfill the speech of hope that uh, Secretary Byrne, uh, Byrne's uh, made, issued in uh, Stuttgart. Uh, if we condemn a whole generation uh, to permanent uh, uh, poverty because of debts that should never have been accumulated, uh, we are doing a major disservice to Europe. Let's talk about uh, the media for a second. Mm -hmm. You have been invited to England by the Labour Party for a series of talks. Jeremy Corbyn, a socialist, was elected to leadership several months ago. The media in England has been quite ferocious in its, in its attacks. You, and even The Guardian had negative opinions about you, calling you anti-EU. Um, from your experience, do you have any thoughts on how the left can defend itself against these sort of attacks from the centrist media as well as the right-wing press? Ignore them and articulate reason, reasonable, rational policies which eventually, through the strength of their uh, rationality and pertinence, manage to push through the barriers of distortion of the media and touch the, um, uh, the minds and the hearts of the audience. Dis disintermediation is the name of the game that is speak directly to the public, bypassing the media, and then the media will shift their position too. Um, also, what's very rarely known or talked about is the entire atmosphere in doing the negotiation process, what politicians go through, how much time, deadlines, and so forth and so on. So James Galbraith uh, mentioned that it was quite chaotic, the entire negotiations in the European Union. Um, and also that uh, another, um, our reporter from Greece uh, reported that uh, there was never enough time for politicians that came back, Greek politicians that came back to have a meaningful debate uh, presented to the public whenever some new proposal came. Could you talk about your experience uh, in these negotiation processes? It's worse than that. It's worse than that. <laughs> it's worse than that. Because uh, as Henry Kissinger said once, um, when I want to talk, he said to the, to, to, to the leaders of Europe, I don't know who, whom to talk to. Who do I call? I don't have a telephone number. Uh, it, that was a feeling that I was getting. We were negotiating, supposedly, with Europe. But Europe appeared to us as a troika, three institutions. Now, each one of them had its own agenda. And those agendas were clashing against one another. So the IMF, for instance, the International Monetary Fund, was very sympathetic to a position that the first uh, de part of the deal should be debt relief in order to be able to stabilize the macroeconomy and to render the Greek economy and the Greek society reformable. The Commission, fearing the position of several finance ministers who were adamant that there should be no debt relief, blocked that. Um, the European Central Bank had its own agenda. Within the institutions, you talk to um, the, the, the head of the Commission, you got one view. You talk to somebody lower down the food chain within the, the, the Commission, you got a completely different view. So you can imagine how frustrating it is when you don't know who to negotiate with. The, the other side is fragmented both vertically within the institutions and horizontally across the institutions. And let me say something that may strike our audience particularly um, uh, in terms of its weirdness, but it's completely true. We never had any proposals from the outside. You mentioned that we, couldn't go, we didn't have the time to go back and debate the proposals we had with parliament, with cabinet, with society at large. We never had any proposals from them until the 25th of June when we got an ultimatum. During the period of negotiations between January and June, it was a merry-go-round. 
we were being asked what we what our policy was on privatization. We would uh, present our policy on privatization. They would disagree, and then they say, yes, but what about VAT? Then we would talk about value-added tax, VAT. Um, they would reject our proposal. They wouldn't give us a proposal. And you even proposed uh, 500 uh, tax advisors from Germany, um, if I'm correct. We proposed all sorts of, sorts of things. I even proposed a debt break, uh, um, which is a very German thing, and it was ignored. Look, if, let's, let's, let's be clear about this. There was never an intention by the other side to reach an honorable agreement with us. The only objective was to humiliate a government that dared say to their face that the program that the Troika had been implementing for the last five years in Greece had failed. It's as simple as that. It was naked power politics of the 19th century type. So to my last question, and uh, I want to try to see the, what we think is the fundamental of the crisis, mm -hmm. um, part of the uh, fundamentals. There's a YouTube video of a lecture by Vivek Chibber, a professor of sociology and politics that has been floating around since 2007. Mm -hmm. In it, he talks about how the state has built in structural bias against labor and in favor of capital. He mentions that even when left-wing parties achieve power, the first thing that they do is go to the investors before even considering the needs of the voters. That if, that if investors are not satisfied with election outcomes and party mandates, they may take action in the form of an investment strike, thereby starving the state of badly needed funds for government programs. Eventually, the same people who voted for a left party uh, go and vote for another party, basically vote them out. What do you make of this argument? And do you think the reform approach can work without massive mobilization? That's the first part. And are we doomed to be forever locked in a battle with capital? Or is there an alternative? Well, you're talking to a left-winger, so it's quite predictable what I'm going to say. Of course, this is not the level playing field. If you have an agenda in favor of redistributing, from profits to wages, if you have an agenda for taxing the top 0.1% in order to bolster low pensions, you have an uphill battle because there is uh, a, a triangle of sin, as I call it, uh, that is going to oppose you to the nail, which is perfectly normal and perfectly natural. And that triangle comprises the media owners, uh, the banking establishment, the financial sector, and uh, those who have a very cozy relationship with the state in terms of procurement, uh, development, and so on and so forth. Uh, but at least you have a chance in places like the United Kingdom, um, like in India, like um, in the United States, even, in Canada. In Europe, things are far, far, far worse. And the reason they are far worse is because we don't have a parliament which is capable of uh, keeping checks and balances on the executive. So there is a policy on labor markets. There is a policy on fiscal policy, on fiscal matters. There's a policy on monetary policy. But there is no parliament which can even theoretically say to those who are in control of this policy, you know what, you're fired. In the United States, there is a Congress. In Britain, there is uh, the House of Commons. Uh, even the House of Lords has a capacity to um, impose certain constraints on George Osborne, for instance. In Europe, we have the European Parliament that, by definition and design, cannot legislate. So we have the Eurogroup, which passes all these de decisions regarding, for instance, labor markets in Greece. Uh, but there is no Parliament that can dismiss the Eurogroup. The fact that the Greek finance minister or the German finance minister can be um, fired by the Greek or the German parliament is neither here nor there. Because the Greek um, member of the Eurogroup goes to the Greek parliament and says, I disagreed with what the Eurogroup did. And maybe he did or she did. So we have a fundamental lack of liberal democracy, even bourgeois capitalist liberal democracy. So the struggle for looking after the weak in a place like the Eurozone is infinitely more difficult than it is in the United States or in Britain. Yanis Varoufakis, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. And that is all from the team of Munich. Please tune in on www.activism.org. Thank you for joining us.